Domenico de Soleil is chairman of Tom Ford International, the menswear brand that now includes beauty, accessories, fragrance, and footwear. He is a lawyer by training, but made the transition to the fashion business when Gucci, one of the clients he did legal work for, hired him to join the company. That was in 1984. Over the next 20 years, he engineered a remarkable turnaround, saving Gucci from hostile suitors and acquiring such key brands as Yves Saint Laurent and Alexander McQueen. Indeed, in the fashion world, the standard phrase for managing a successful turnaround has become, quote, doing a Gucci. We asked Domenico de Soleil to talk about the fashion business in a down economy, the current consumer mentality, temperamental designers, leadership, and how he has managed to be so successful in what might be considered a turbulent industry. Thank you for joining us. You're welcome. My questions to you a year ago would have been very different than they are today. I'm sure. <laughs> Given what's going on in the economy in general and the fashion business in particular, how's business and what strategies are you adopting to, to minimize the downturn? Uh, okay. Uh, business, I'm talking about in general, uh, is very difficult for, I think I would say, all the luxury company. The whole luxury industry has had really a, a difficult time. I think there are several factors that have intervened. Obviously, the huge crisis of last uh, fall that is continuing. And, uh, and I, I've been in the business for a long time. I never see anything that was so deep and, and on such a worldwide basis. Uh, from the way I, look, I hear about the industry, what I've seen from results from several companies, Asia is still working reasonably well. China is still growing. Hong Kong is still growing. But every other country has had very, very strong, uh, uh, very difficult times. This has been very, very weak. Uh, and there are a lot of factors. Obviously, the general economic situation. Uh, Japan economy has been very difficult for a long time now. And this year is particularly difficult. I was in Japan last week, and it was all over the press that uh, exports in Japan had declined 46% in the last quarter. So you can imagine how difficult it is for the economy. In the United States, I think it's a combination of factors that is impacting on the luxury industry. I think the first one was, is certainly is the general economic situation, the, the, the financial meltdown of this fall. But on top of that, there is another fact that occurred in the United States at some point last year, you may remember. Uh, one department store in particular that carries a lot of luxury brands suddenly at the beginning of November went on sale, a very radical approach, you know, marking everything down 70%. Right. So this certainly created a very complex situation because a lot of business, all the fashion business, and all the great luxury companies have stores in New York, so we really confronted a very complicated situation. And some um, uh, followed the, the lead and marked down products in a, in a way that was really unprecedented. And obviously, it's very difficult to tell your consumers now that in the spring season, products are full price. They're supposed to buy full price, something they were giving away three months ago. Right. Right. So I think in the United States, there's an added factor that I believe is creating a difficult time for luxury brands. But uh, it business is difficult everywhere, as I said, yeah. with the yeah. exception of... Uh, uh, China and Hong Kong this thing seems to be holding. Uh, Korea actually is doing reasonably well because the one is, uh, has depreciated, so there are a lot of tourists that go to Korea to buy luxury goods. But by and large, I think it's a very difficult climate. I sense, uh, and actually I believe that 2009 is going to be the last year for the industry. It's going to be a very, very difficult year. Wow. I doubt it's going to be a recovery. Uh, and uh, I think that probably will continue to have difficult times in 2010 mm -hmm. with the situation improving in, I think, toward the end of 2010, 2011. So I have a rather realistic, I think I wouldn't say pessimistic view. Yeah. Uh, long term, however, there are really a lot of, there's a lot of schools of thoughts about long term. Uh, my experience, I've been around for a long time, given my age, and I always heard that, you know, after great, horrible situation, economic depressions or uh, difficult events like 9-11, I always heard, you know, things have changed forever. Uh, I just happen, I don't believe it. I think that consumers, say, you know, people forget this mm -hmm. is human nature. People are optimistic, most of them by nature. So I am convinced that, that obviously we will 
do quite well. You know, the luxury industry will come back, mm -hmm. I think. But uh, uh, the real issue that nobody knows is how long it's going to take. Right. When? And that's really when. Nobody knows when. And I think, you know, my guess is going to take some time. But well, long term, I'm quite optimistic. What would you? What kind of strategy would you suggest a luxury goods? I uh, think the the, the important call. strategy for all the luxury goods, and I think that all the, you know, the, the excellent manager they are there, they understand the strategy. The strategy should be, uh, the traditional side of managing for cash in difficult times. You know, watch your costs very aggressively, but at the same time, stay the course with the brand. I think that uh, suddenly start counting prices really doesn't make a lot of sense. I think at the end of the day. Uh, I think it was imperative for luxury companies to deliver good value. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean the price have to be lower. Just make sure that whatever is delivered has a good value, right. great, great quality, great fashion, great trend. Depends from brand to brand. But I think that the, the, the savviest people, we know the number one is to stay the course. Okay. All right. I know that attorneys are often hired by the people they represent, but to go from a job handling tax matters for a Washington, D.C. law firm to becoming eventually CEO of Gucci, that's quite a switch. Why did you make that move, and why do you think it worked so well over that 20-year span? Uh, uh, I would tell you, the, the, first of all, the move was really by chance. I was, uh, I was representing the Gucci family, one side of the Gucci family, and uh, the company ran a huge tax problem at some point back in uh, the 80s, early 80s. And so uh, a side of the family asked me to become president of Gucci America to, uh, to really help them resolve the tax issues, which I did. In the meantime, the company, American company, had a lot of problems, so I fixed the problems and, uh, and, and stayed there. And the company did quite well, actually. Mm -hmm. And then when the last family member took over the company, uh, unfortunately, he was not the best manager. In 1994, basically, the old group went bankrupt, stop paying, uh, stop paying employees. So the then shareholders at the time, which is a private equity company that purchased the share of Maurizio Gucci and the other members of the family, asked me in 1994 to move from the United States to Italy, and then I became where I became the CEO of the old group. And uh, so that's really something that really happened to me. Right. There was no planning there. I, in fact, when the company really ran into trouble in 1994, 93, 94 period, I considered to go back to to be a lawyer uh -huh. uh, until I got a phone call and I was asked to move to Italy to see if I could fix the company. Wow. Um, you're credited with saving Gucci from bankruptcy, making it profitable, prestigious once again, by using what one newspaper calls American-style management practices. I'm wondering what those practices were and how you implemented them. Uh, uh, I would say that's, uh, that has been defined very, very simply as I will tell the students here today, but I tell the story of the company, what, uh, what I did, the company was broke in 1994 when I came back, went back, and I, I tried to look at the business in a, in a very, in a rational, analytical way. Uh, we were, a, a most important, I, I was, I am a very driven person, and, uh, and I think we, I had very clear ideas at that time, because I already served for several years as the president of Gucci America. So I had a pretty good understanding of the problems of the company, the strength of the brand. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I, I, I just parachuted in a situation which was catastrophic. But by the same token, I recognized that there were a lot of very competent people, and, uh, and I thought that turned out that to be a good leader. Did I really rally them and make sure that everybody understood the direction we were going? I always be able to deal with people well. Mm -hmm. I came from a culture also in which I recognized talent, so I'm not afraid of surrounding myself with competent people. And most important, I was very lucky because I, the other survivor that was there at that point as the company collapsed was Tom Ford. And I really felt, uh, they wanted to fire Tom Ford, actually. But I thought that was really stupid. I thought Tom Ford was quite good, actually. <laughs> so not as only a designer, I kept, though. as a designer, right. I, I said, well, I think this guy is great. So I, I, I uh, Tom, uh, I convinced Tom to stay, to become creative director of the company. And I turned out it was a brilliant decision because Tom turned out to be probably the great designer of the last 50 years. And, uh, and so we worked well together. Mm -hmm. And, but not only with him, you know, we had a great team. You know, I was able to get all, everybody on the same page. Everybody, and we had a very clear strategy. Everybody understood where we were going. And we made decisions very quickly. There was this great sense of urgency. 
and, um, and so everything really worked out well. In fact, when I arrived in Florence from the United States after leaving Gucci America uh, to take over the company, uh, the, the, the CFO of uh, Invest Corp, which was the owner of, of Gucci at the time, welcomed me in Florence. We were in the cafeteria and he said, well, he said, I hope you can do something here because Gucci is an albatross around our neck. Uh, less than two years later, they sold the company and made $2 billion in profit. So, yes, and I still better. remember the story. <laughs> right. You know, there are stories about high profile, high powered businessmen, executives starting out together in a business relationship and then for some reason coming to blows. But I know that you and Tom Ford bring different strengths to, this, to the current partnership in Tom Ford International. What makes the relationship between the two of you work so well? But first of all, there's a great relationship of trust. In a sense, I trust Tom 1,000%, and I think he trusts me 1,000%. The second thing, I think that we have very deep respect. I think Tom is a creative genius. And also, I really do believe that in life to be successful, you have to have two great knowledges. One, what you know, and two, what you don't know. And I'm totally aware that, uh, that I'm not a creative person. So I, I, I understand a collection. I can tell you if it's going to sell, it's not going to sell. I think I do very well with that. But I'm not a creative person. I wouldn't know how to do it. Right. Okay. So I have a great, immense respect for Tom, and he's a expertise and I don't pretend to be a creative person myself so I think there's a very clear definition of roles and uh, and 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 also I have to tell you that I really have an extraordinary admiration for Tom you know because uh, you see as as I'll be talking about today uh, here at Wharton that you see as a businessman, okay, and you can learn about merchandise, you can learn about stores, I, you can learn about understanding what is a good product, a bad product, you can learn how to, how to understand what product is sellable, what the product will not sell, what is a good fashion show, what is not a good fashion show. However, being creative is a totally different universe. I think creative people can see things that normal human being cannot. So, and I always, most important, I always, Treat, uh, treat Tom with immense respect. I think he has a, a quality which is very, very extraordinary. Right, right. I remember uh, Mr. when I was fighting with LVMH, uh, we were fighting every day in the press, and I don't know, I don't know what he said, and, I, and I, I basically, I said, I usually don't agree with anything he says, but one thing I agree with, the business bands are a dime a dozen. <laughs> it's true. Mm -hmm. Creative people are truly yeah. extraordinary. Yeah, so. Do you have a sense of how social networking sites, viral marketing, buzz marketing, you know, product placement, all these new marketing techniques, how they, how they are changing the way we perceive and buy fashion? I think that obviously all the, the uh, there are all a lot of ways these days to, yeah. to make your, you know, story around. Uh, I would say the thing that over the last year I've seen really become very, very important, I think that there has been, uh, uh, it was started a really long time ago to this really uh, celebrities being dressed by designers now some time right. ago and that has become really very popular and uh, and and actually now is also spread by all sorts of magazines about who's wearing what uh, when so all of that is becoming in a way much more important the kind of PR with mm -hmm. celebrities mm -hmm. that you know has already started a long time ago but it's become now much more mm -hmm. prominent because I think the widespread uh, um, development of a lot of in the new, I was, I would call it gossip type magazines. Uh, so that's been obviously uh, word of mouth with the internet, and you know yes. there are a lot of forms. So it's become much more, uh, more prominent and important. Uh, by the same token, I really do believe that uh, uh, excellent PR and uh, you know, you know, it, the ability really to project the image of the brand consistently is still very, very important. That's one of the real great strengths of Tom, not only to be a great designer uh, that can design beautiful clothes and wonderful accessory. Also, Tom has an amazing eye, an amazing marketing ability. Mm -hmm. He's done some of the greatest campaign. I, uh, I still buy all the fashion magazines just to look at the ads. And it's amazing to me how many people now they're redoing what Tom, yeah. that we were doing with Tom, like, you know, the 18, 1994 and 1995. Uh -huh. Tom was really 
it really uh, an avant-garde. It's really changed that uh, in a very successful manner. Given, given all these new marketing techniques, though, do you feel that it's more difficult to control the brand image? Uh, uh, it, yes and no, yes. But at the end of the day, it's very, very important to be very disciplined with everything you do. So uh, I think that uh, that can always be controlled. I think it's up to the management of any brand to make sure that the image of the brand is always controlled. Uh, in what ways do you think that the financial downturn has changed the consumers? You mentioned this, you started out talking about this a little bit, but you know, consumers now are, are pushing back on price. They're much more sale and con discount conscious. Will this be a long-term change or is this, as you said earlier uh, a little bit, this, they might revert back to their old ways once the, the recession is over? Uh, that again, you know, there are different. There's, nobody knows the real answer, but my instinct tells me that this is obviously I recognize a very difficult time. I think it's going to last. It's not. It's not going to be fixed in yeah. a few months. And I think that people obviously are very, very concerned. But uh, my my experience is that uh, um, is that at the end of the day, the consumer they forget. And uh, you know, people, you know, if they love luxury brand, historically, if you think about it, you know, it was the Stone Age. People were buying bracelets and earrings, you know, made of stone. So okay. it's something that's part of are, human right? nature. Right. Uh, and it depends what kind of stones, yes. yes. <laughs> but the bottom line it is a part of human nature. So I really do, uh, uh, at least my sense it is, that, that the things will get back okay. yeah. to, be, uh, to be good. Uh, by the same token, uh, the real issue it is that, at least in my view, that it's going to last some time. And how long it's going to last, I really, I really believe that nobody knows. I think sure. it's going to be a year or two or three. Uh, nobody's aware of it. Nobody okay. knows. But uh, I think that things will go back. Can you name two or three leadership qualities that you think an executive needs to have to manage successfully? Uh, I, yes. Uh, first of all, I, I really do believe that the most important thing is to be able to communicate effectively with his own people. See, one thing at Gucci we were very good. It was a, it was a really communicate as a guy told me, it was a communication power. We talked all the time. People really knew. I had this uh, habit from day one that I would go in the cafeteria of the company in Florence, and I continued that throughout my career. And uh, and 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 every. Two or three weeks, I would talk to people, meaning that everybody, including cleaning people, everybody, I would just tell them how the company was doing, what we were trying to do. I think it's very important to say that, there's, that everybody in the company understands what's our mission, what we are trying to do, and everybody is trying to be on the same page. That I think is incredibly important. Um, uh, that's one thing. That the second, uh, uh, so that's. I think that is the most important thing in leadership. Obviously, in uh, uh, the second thing, it would be to hire very competent people, just not to be, uh, not to be open to debate. Mm -hmm. Also, I, I came from uh, it, that was a little bit natural for me because you understand I came from legal background. Mm -hmm. So, right. uh, if you're in a law firm, it, it's not very hierarchical, and somebody was number one in his class at. Harvard, for example, law school, it doesn't matter that he or she is young, you know, there's respect for intellectual ability. So I always grew up with that background. So I always wanted to hire competent people and I want to hear what they had to say, basically. I think it's very important for a leader to be open minded and, and invite debate and people to talk about the issues very openly. And so that obviously is very important. And, and also, I try, oh, you know, before I took over the company, our person run, the last family member around the company, was doing a lot of things that I thought didn't make any sense. So in part, I learned in a negative way just looking at what was going on. And I said, well, why is guys doing learned this? Learn from the wrong example. And, and you can <laughs> learn. And I remember this one example, I always talk about it, that, that every time there was a problem, uh, this gentleman would really be... Uh, it was really uh, trying to find out who'd done it, you know, who was... Uh, it, it, and I really noticed that there was basically silly in a, in a company was is an issue of, pr of processes. So mm -hmm. if the mistake is made, I, I don't care who's done it. Then we have to understand why we made the mistake, okay. and just make sure that we look forward. We don't repeat the same mistake. But this sort of hunt for the, the for culprit. The, <laughs> the culprit, I thought it was very okay. silly. Okay. So I had we had a great management team. I, we became really stars in the industry because a phenomenal management team, and I, we hired. A, 
all the best people. It was very open uh, mm -hmm. uh, management style. My daughter was always open. I would talk to anybody. And, uh, and I, I tried to hire great people, let them do their job. And uh, so and it really worked very well. What, what are your expa expansion plans going forward for Tom Ford International? Uh, just we, uh, it's, a very, it's a very young company. Yeah. And uh, we opened with really immense success our first store in New York just a year ago, a year and a half ago. And then uh, last year we opened New York. We are now uh, present in some of the best uh, locations, Burford Goodman, Neiman Marcus in the United States, Harrods in London, and uh, we are uh, opened a beautiful store in Milan last year. So the plan for the next year and a half is to open in the United States in um, Beverly Hills and in uh, probably Vegas. We're looking at a project there. And then uh, obviously the most important step that we're now undertaking would be to expand in Asia. Asia we will China, be opening, we will be, exactly, we will be opening uh, this fall in Isetan in Tokyo and in, uh, in the Galleria in Korea, which is like the Burford Goodman of Korea. And then uh, obviously looking at China and Hong Kong. Right. So that would be the next step. My last question is, what advice would you give to any man or woman who has just been named head of a fashion house? I would just, uh, I said, because of the difficult times to, to, you know, to manage for cash, obviously. But the most important thing is some uh, would say, you know, just stay the course. You understand what, what your brand is all about. You can't really start changing every, that would be the worst thing to do. Stay the course. And one thing that I also found that was very, very important in our business, I spend an enormous amount of time visiting stores. I used to talk to the store people all the time. Because if you really want to know what is going on in the retail business, you should go and talk to the sell people. They are right. there. They see the customers every day. They know what is working. They know what needs to be done. So my biggest advice is just devote time. The stores are very important. At the end of the day, uh, the store is the way, you know, the soul of the brand. You know, and for most mm -hmm. people, they are not uh, uh, sophisticated about fashion. A brand is your store. You know, yeah. if you mention, say, Chanel to people, they think immediately about the Chanel store. So being in the store, understanding the store, make sure the brand is properly presented, I think is very important. And therefore, if you want to be an effective CEO of the brand, devoting time in the store, traveling, seeing the store, understanding your markets, I think is very important. Thank you.